the representations of destruction part 84. We are to give the first, second, and third angel's message. We are to repeat it in Russian chapter 14, verses 14 through 19. That's where we're at. To bring in the people for salvation is our responsibility, nobody else's. Who else knows the message? Surely not your neighbors. Have we reached our neighbors? We're going to be judged for a lot of things. A lot of things. And we're going to be judged in how we took care of our body. Did we apply those Ten Commandments correctly? Did we respect them? Everyone is responsible for each other. Did you know that? Alan G. White's Apocalyptic Fulfilled Prophecy Dates. The Lisbon Earthquake was November the 1st, 1755. The many people in the world are rejecting it. Never, it had nothing to do with last day events. The Dark Day, May 19th, 1780. It took place. But many people are rejecting it. Some people don't even know. The Falling Stars, November 13, 1833. All these three key components, they're fulfilled. It took place. And there's many Seventh-day Adventists and other theologians that are saying, this is bogus. It never happened. It doesn't have nothing to do with last day events. Oh, yes, it does. Yes, it does. I was instructed that destruction had gone forth upon the cities. The word of the Lord will be fulfilled. Isaiah 29, verse 19 to 24 was repeated. Turn with me to Isaiah chapter 29. Father, in the name of Yeshua, as we all open our word, bless us and give us a spirit of discernment. Help us to see this message and comprehend it. It is our prayer in the name of Yeshua. Amen. Turn with me to the book of Isaiah, chapter 29. <clears throat> Good morning. Isaiah, chapter 29, verse 19. Isaiah, chapter 29, verse 19. <clears throat> The meek also shall increase their joy in the Yahweh, and the poor among men shall rejoice in the Holy One of Israel. Excuse me. Yeah. Yeah. Isaiah chapter 29. Isaiah chapter 29. Verse 19. Isaiah chapter 29, verse 19. Once again, Isaiah chapter 29, verse 19. Once again, the meek also shall increase their joy in the Yahweh, and the poor among men shall rejoice in the Holy One of Israel. Can we hear an amen? Mm -hmm. Let us rejoice this morning. Because the issue here that I'm going to present has not been fulfilled. The pantheon out there in Nashville, Tennessee, is going to be hurt, hurt, and destroyed by a meteor. So a lot of people, especially the Seventh-day Adventist Church Organization in Silver Springs, Maryland, the representatives of the church worldwide, they are denying that Alan G. White ever said this when it did. And the reason why they're saying this to the public and to the world is so that the people will not stop going to Tennessee. What's wrong with these people? Alan White says that Nashville is going to get hit, not only Nashville, but other cities with meteors. There's a pantheon out there. It stands, it stands very high. Or it's tall. It's a humongous statue of Diana. That is an abomination. We're not supposed to do that. But they did it. So therefore, the meteor is going to hit. But it's not the only reason why. You see, Nashville is going to be destroyed as well as other cities. And when that meteor hits, it's going to destroy everything around it. And I'm giving it a 360-mile radius. That's what I'm saying. It does damage. And nobody's going to be able to clean it up. So what I'm going to share here is what's coming. Now, I know there's been others that have gone before me that have shared this in the last couple of years. But it's time now to understand that if you're going there then you're going to be going to your grave sooner than you thought, okay? 
We're not supposed to go somewhere where there's destruction. Come. Now for others that are leaving, going north, bunkering in those mountains and so forth, that's more safety. There's volcanoes all over the earth. There's volcanoes all over the United States. There's earthquakes always occurring. Now just recently, I believe in New York City, there was an earthquake that was at 4.1. 4. 4. 4. Everybody felt it. Are you waking up people in regards to what's occurring? Let us continue. I was instructed that the destruction had gone forth upon the cities. The word of the Lord will be fulfilled. Isaiah 29 verse 19 and 24 was, re was repeated. Take note. I dared not move not knowing where I was. I cried unto the Lord. What does it mean? These representations of destruction were repeated. I want to focus on what was discussed last night. So we can understand that this is really, really serious. It's not something to be thinking that, oh no, it's just going to pass us by. Oh no, a Sunday law is just going to pass us by. Oh no, it's not. Because when that Sunday law comes, it's over, Seventh-day Adventists. All of you Seventh-day Adventists better learn to be holy. And I do mean holy. People might say you might be fanatics, but guess what? You're walking the right line. You're walking the right road. Manuscript 126, 1908. You can go to page 2 on this one. In reading, Where am I? Said the Lord. In scenes I have represented that which will be, but warn my people to cease from putting their trust in men who are not obedient to my warnings and who despise my reproof, for the day of the Lord is right upon the world when evidence shall be made sure. Now listen to me. Our Savior says, But warn my people to cease from pu putting their trust in men who are not obedient to my warnings. So the 3 ABN Amazing Facts and all these TV stations of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, all these pastors were telling you to get injected. They weren't telling you what was inside the vaccine. And so all of you in all your Seventh-day Adventist churches, you all seen your families and your brothers and your sisters and your mothers and your dads die off. Because Pastor Doug Bashler didn't tell you what was in there, which was the poison. And so various corporations were testing all this information on the people because they've never tested it before. And we're not supposed to be vaccinated. This is what it's talking about. And now I'm sharing here, standing with you, letting you know that the meter is going to hit Tennessee. And if you don't believe me, then you continue staying in Tennessee. Go to Tennessee, and we'll see you in heaven. Those who have followed the voices, plural, voices, that would turn things upside down will themselves be turned where they're, where what? Where they cannot see, but will be as blind men. Here's your reference. These words were given me from Isaiah 30, verses 8 to 15, quoted. Take note. Three days later, three days later from the synopsis that I gave to us earlier, in making reference to these words, she added, Ellen G. White, she was given the vision. I was instructed that light had been given me and that I had written under special light the Lord had imparted. So it was imparted to her to give to who? To give to the world. Not just Seventh-day Adventists, to give to the world. A prophet is a prophet for all people. It's not a prophet for the Protestant churches or the Catholic church. That's not a prophet. A prophet is a prophet for every nationality in the world. No denomination's got the power to give you salvation. And they're not going to give you salvation because they're fallen people themselves. The Seventh-day Adventist church is not going to give you salvation. Writing to her son, Willis E. White, who stabbed her in the back and changed his mother's writings and books, etc., and was involved in writing The Desire of Ages. You want to continue following man's ideas? Go ahead. I'll see you in heaven. On August 27, Mrs. White added concerning these fury arrows that were flying in every direction. Whoa! Arrows flying in every direction with our meteors. From these multiple balls of fire. Listen to that. Balls of fire. It was impossible to check the fires that were kindled. 
and many places were being destroyed. The terror of the people was indescribable. After a time, Mr. Everett, Pope after a Frederick time, Virginia. thank you. After a time, I awoke and found myself at home. After a time, I saw my. Mm -hmm, let me continue. After a time, I awoke and found myself at home. In reading. She concluded the letter with this cryptic remark. Here it comes. I have had many things open to me, but it is not my duty to reveal all that will surely come to those who manifest a spirit to walk contrary to the way God has marked out for them. Everyone will be rewarded as his work shall be. Hmm? Are you giving the message, sister? Sir, are you giving the message? Because if you're not giving the message, don't expect to be in the kingdom. Were these balls of fire, which Alan White witnessed twice in the space of two years, so there's two witnesses, thermonuclear explosions. What's she say? Thermonuclear explosions. More mightier than the Hiroshima bomb did hit I believe in the year 1945 in Japan. You know the history? You've seen the movies? I know you like to watch TV. Now, everybody wants to go see that new movie that came out with King Kong and what's the other one? King Kong and who else? Hmm? It's a new one that came out. Godzilla. Get a hold of this, Godzilla. Were these balls of fire which Alan White witnessed twice in the space of two years, thermonuclear explosions, question mark. It is impossible today to give a dogmatic answer, but a ball of fire is one of the most obvious identifying characteristics of atomic explosions. That's what's going to hit Nashville, Nashville, Tennessee, and all of you who are running over there, Seventh-day Adventists. So that tunnel that's underground that goes for about 5, 10 miles, it ain't going to save you. You don't have to show me, sister, but guess what? That tunnel is just going to help you to be in the ground a little longer because it's going to be hit. And I'm sharing this is because we know a ministry that's there. That has a tunnel, it's underground, etc. And they're going to use it as a bunker to protect them for what is coming. But a ball of fire is one of the most obvious identifying characteristics of atomic explosions, of which the first man-made one was yet some 40 years in the future. Listen to what Ellen White is saying here, ladies and gentlemen. Writing from Europe in the Review and Herald in the year of 1886, Mrs. White described the destruction of Sodom and the cities of the plain. Let's go to Genesis chapter 20, chapter 19, verse 29. Genesis chapter 19, what verse? I need some help. Genesis 19. Verse 29. In reading your hearing. And it came to pass, when Elohim destroyed the cities of the plain, that Elohim remembered Abraham and sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow when he overthrew the cities in the which Lot dwelt. Hmm? Let me read it again. Let's read it again. And it came to pass, when Elohim destroyed the cities. This is the after effect of Nashville and Tennessee. This is just an analogy. Take note. And it came to pass when Elohim destroyed the cities of the plain that Elohim remembered Abraham. So Elohim is going to remember his remnant people who are faithful and true if they're in Tennessee. Now take note. And it came to pass when Elohim destroyed the cities of the plain that Elohim remembered Abraham and sent Lot out of the midst of of the overthrow when he overthrew the cities in the which Lot dwelt. The angels are going to go and pull you out. Matter of fact, they're actually asking you 
and calling you out now before the destruction comes. That's what's happening right now, Sister Elizabeth. About 1900 BC, in this graphic depiction, as the sun arose for the last time upon the cities of the plain, the people thought to commence another day of godless riot. Yes. All were eagerly planning their businesses or their pleasure, and the messenger of Elohim was derided for his fears and his warnings. Suddenly, as the thunder peal from the unclouded sky fell balls of fire on the doomed capital. This is what's coming to Tennessee. And I'm glad it's coming. Because it's a prophecy. And the people are supposed to be, who are holy, out of there. You're not supposed to be there. And it's coming because you're not evangelizing the state. Just like the sister the other day called me up and she said she sold everything. There's nothing left. She's just got her little little studio that she's living in. The Seventh-day Adventist Church stole her property, stole the church. Her husband passed away. He was a dentist. She, she sold everything. There was other buildings, other churches, administration, etc. She said, Brother Gonzalez, our Savior's coming. And that's right, he's coming. But he's coming to take his people home. That's what he's coming for. Destruction is going to take place for the wicked. You want to stay in Tennessee? You continue staying there. Oh, the land's a lot cheaper? I think that my life is more valuable. I'm going north. How about you? Then immediately Ellen White made this stunning application to the end of the world. Did you hear that? End of the world, utmost end of earth's history. Daniel chapter 12. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be, who is Yeshua HaMashiach, Elohim. The people will be eating and drinking, planting and building, marrying and giving in marriage, until the wrath of Elohim shall be poured out without mixture of mercy. The world will be rocked rocked to sleep in the cradle of carnal security. That's where they're going to be rocked at. You want security? Yeshua says, I'm going to give you security. If indeed I had stood where the end of the world began, and if nuclear destruction is to be a part and parcel of the climax of events just preceding the second coming, then Mrs. White's a Assurances for Christians in this context must be especially appreciated and encouraging. This is why it's so important for you to graduate from school. Because the schools are giving you an education. And if it wasn't for schools giving you an education, then everybody would be ignorant. You can go to these Christian churches, Christian schools, Seventh-day Adventist schools, all you want. But if they're preaching you apostasy and books of a new order, etc., it's not worth it, is it? And we are told that if our students or our children are going to the public schools that it's not good, etc. There's evil involved, etc. Well, where in the world do you want them to go? We can do homeschooling. Everything's coming to a close, people. And for those of you who aren't married, I don't, I don't suggest you get married because your children is going to go through catastrophe. For she declares, while the 91st Psalm, a thousand shall fall at thy side and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee, has been the refuge of God's people in every age during the three thousand years since David first redu reduced it to writing. Yet it has a special application to those who live just before the close of probation. Let's go to Psalms 91. Turn with me to Psalms chapter 91. And the 91st Psalms is a most wonderful description of the coming of the Lord to bring the wickedness of the wicked to an end and to give to those who have chosen Him as the Redeemer 
the assurance of his love and protecting care. Psalms 91, verses 1 through 15, quoted. The righteous understand God's government and will triumph with holy gladness in the everlasting protection and salvation that Christ, through his merits, has secured for them. Can we hear an amen? Let all remember this and forget not that the wicked who do not receive Christ as their personal Savior understand not his providence, the way of, the, of righteousness they have not chosen. Psalms 91. So, 91st Psalms. 91st Psalms. Verse 1. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Yahweh, He is my refuge and my fortress. My Elohim in Him will I trust. Well, you better do that now. You better make sure that you are experiencing the sealing. You've experienced the earth and the latter rain. Make sure that you're receiving the gifts, you're practicing your gifts to give this message. It's not about going to church and listening to a dead sermon, smooth, smooth sermon, saying hello or just smiling and you don't even know the majority of the people within the church. In the 91st Psalms is a most wonderful description of the coming of the Lord. To bring the wickedness of the wicked to an end. And to give to those who have chosen him as the Redeemer the assurance of his love and protecting care. I care for people in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. But I don't care for liars and cheaters that are continuing to teach from books of the New Order lies, 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 lies. I don't like that. And it is not my responsibility to condemn the people, but I don't want you lying to me if you don't want to read the truth. Don't share it with me. Because you and I are, are, are two distinct different people. I want to respect the dialogue, yes, but how in the world can we compare Scripture with Scripture if you're in a different order? Our Savior is testing us tonight, this morning, this evening. Wherever you might be, whoever's viewing, we're different time zones. You've seen the destruction in California. You've seen the tsunamis that are taking place in various countries because they're not keeping the commandments and their warnings. You've seen the volcanoes erupt all over the world in various locations. You, you, you've experienced that. Various people, many people have died and passed away. You've seen the sickness that have come into the world. What are you all waiting for? What our Savior is waiting for is waiting for all of us to go and give this message. Because the angels are going to speak to you, my friends. When a pastor speaks, it's the angels speaking to them. When the evangelists speak, the laymen speak, it's the angels speaking to you to touch and ring the citadel of that mind that's been created in the image of Yeshua to repent and to prepare for the coming of Yeshua. That's just doing the work. Well, the Holy Spirit is enlightening your electrolytes to be converted. In reading, in the 91st Psalm is a most wonderful description of the coming of the Yahweh. To bring the wickedness of the wicked to an end and to give to those who have chosen him as their Redeemer the assurance of his love and protecting care. How interested and excited I was then while eating at my last meal in Hiroshima. Take note, at our church built after the atomic devastation, August 6, 1945. It's an experience that someone had that I'm using. I wasn't there. I wasn't even born then. But the person continues to share. Built after the atomic devastation of August 6, 1945, when the local church elder responded to our question, it's as follows. How many Seventh-day Adventists died in that first atomic blast in the year of 1945? As this Japanese Christian leader looked at us, his eyes began to brim with tears and he answered softly, 
through an interpreter. Listen to me. Through an interpreter, not one. All Japanese were not commandment keepers. They worship different gods. Are you listening to me? For those Seventh-day Adventists that have moved to Tennessee, if they're witnessing, doing his work, okay. But they're given a warning is to get out before it's too late. Yes, some experience radiation burns. Most lost their houses and all earthly possessions, but not one Seventh-day Adventist lost his or her life. Can we hear an amen? Can we hear an amen? amen. The promise was sure, it shall not come nigh thee, only with thy eyes shalt thou behold and see. There shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over thee, to keep thee in all thy ways. They shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. Psalms 91, verses 7 through 12. Take a reading on memory lane. This is powerful. It's a testimony for us. These people were obedient. As early as 1888, she hinted at what was yet to come. The Savior's prophecy concerning the visitation of judgments upon Jerusalem is to have another fulfillment in our time of which that terrible desolation was but a faint shadow in the fate of the chosen city, we may behold the doom of a world that has rejected God's mercy and trampled upon His law. Turn with me to Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20. I will be reading from Signs of the Times, April 15, 18. 75. Are you reading your hearing? Precepts given to guard the Decalogue, to guard the Ten Commandments. In consequence of continued transgression, the moral law was repeated in awful grandeur from Sinai. Christ gave to Moses religious precepts which were to govern everyday life. Number two. These statutes were explicitly given to guard the Ten Commandments. They were not shadowy types to pass away with the death of Christ. They were to be binding upon man in every age as long as time should last. These commands were enforced by the power of the moral law, and they clearly and definitely explained that law. These statutes and statutes that are binding, they're in the feminine. 2707 and 2708. It's referring to worship. Exodus chapter 20, verse 1. And Elohim speak all these words, saying, I am the Yahweh thy Elohim, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt. Seventh-day Adventists, Christians, Catholics, Baptists, Protestants, all of you. Out of the house of bondage. Verse 3, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any grieving image, or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. Tennessee. The pantheon is going to be hit with the meteor. That's what's coming. That prophecy has not been fulfilled, Seventh-day Adventists. Verse 4, Thou shalt not make unto thee any grieving image. Verse 5, Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Yahweh, the Elohim, am a jealous God, Elohim, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. Verse 6, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments and leave and get out of Tennessee now. Verse 7. Thou shalt not take the name of the Yahweh thy Elohim in vain, for the Yahweh will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. How closer do you want me to share this with you? Remember the Sabbath day. That's today. It's a Shabbat day. 
Verse 8, Remember the Shabbat day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work from Sunday to Friday. But the seventh day, which is today, is the Shabbat of the Yahweh thy Elohim. It shall not, what? In it thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days, Sunday to Friday, the Yahweh made heaven and earth, Genesis chapter 1, 2. Those two chapters tells us the weekly cycle of a 24-hour day in six days in the seventh cycle, which are seven days. It has not changed. For in six days the Yahweh made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day, which is today. Wherefore the Yahweh blessed the Sabbath, Shabbat day, and hallowed it. How close are you going to get? Let's go to Leviticus chapter 23 then. Come on, let's go to Leviticus chapter 23. Everybody loves Leviticus chapter 23. Verse 1, And the Yahweh speak unto Moshe, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them concerning the feast of the Yahweh, which ye shall proclaim to be holy convocations. Even these are my feast. Now let's look at the Sabbath, the weekly Sabbath. Verse 3, three listen to this. Six days shall thy work be done, Sunday through Friday, but the seventh day, which is today, the Shabbat, is the Shabbat of rest and a holy convocation. Ye shall do no work therein. It is the Shabbat of the Yahweh in your dwellings. Then it goes on with Passover that's coming in in the third week of April, on the 22nd of April. These are still binding. They're not nailed to the cross. Everything in Leviticus chapter 23 is still binding. The only thing that's not binding is the animal sacrifices, ceremonial law, Seventh-day Adventists, crippling the church and the members to death. When in 1888, the Seventh-day Adventist church turned around and nailed it and rejected the feast. And they think that they know it all. What a shame when the Bible tells us. Tells us specifically what's happened here. Let's go to Hebrews. Let's go to Hebrews for the doubter. Oh, well, it's not in the New Testament. Well, if it's not in the New Testament. Oh, man. Many of us uh, have been mis misguided. Many of us can say, well, it, I don't like that. And you taught me this. And you taught me this way. My grandfather did this. My grandma. I don't care about your grandmother and your grandfather. It's about today. You're alive. You're, you're the one that's worthy today. You're working out your salvation. Let's look at uh, Hebrews chapter 4. Let us therefore fear, let us therefore reverence, at least a promise being left us of entering into his rest. What rest? It's the Shabbat day. Any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel priest, as well as unto them. But the word priest did not profit them, which are the Hebrews, not being mixed with faith, in them that heard it. Verse 3. For we which have believed do enter into his Shabbat rest, as he had said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world, Genesis chapter 1, Genesis chapter 2, verse 4. For he speak in a certain place of the seventh day, Shabbat day to day, on this wise, and Elohim did rest the seventh day from all his works. Can we hear an amen? Verse 5, and in this place again, if they shall enter into my rest. He's talking about the Shabbat. Seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter therein, and they to whom it was first preached enter not in because of unbelief. Verse 7, again he limited a certain day, saying in David, today, comma, after so long a time, as it is said, today if you will hear his voice, harden not your minds. It's not hearts. Your heart only pumps blood. Verse 8. For if Yeshua had given them rest, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day? Verse 9. There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of Elohim. For he that is entered into his rest, he also has ceased from his own works, as Elohim did from his. End of the case. It took years to understand this. 
but you still want to stay in Tennessee, you're not going to be in the kingdom. As early as 1888, Alan G. White, she hinted at what was yet to come. The Savior's prophecy concerning the visitation of judgments upon Jerusalem is to have another fulfillment, of which that terrible desolation was but a faint shadow. Mercy. What's coming? In the fate of the chosen city, we may behold the doom of a world that has rejected God's mercy and trampled upon His law. His commandments, His Torah. Judgment's here. Just after the turn of the century in 1903, Alan G. White enlarged more fully upon this situation with these words. The present is a time of overwhelming interest to all living. Rulers and statesmen, in other words, political officials and governors, etc., Men who occupy positions of trust and authority, thinking men and women of all classes, have their attention fixed upon the events taking place about us. They are watching the strained, restless relations that exist among the nations. They observe the intensity that is taking possession of every earthly element. And they recognize that something great and decisive is about to take place that the world is on the verge of a stupendous crisis. When the United States military ceases and deceases from protecting and supporting Israel, then Turkey, Russia, and the rest of the countries there in Syria are going to attack it. That dome is not going to be there very long. The resources will not be coming into Israel. Right now there is discussion on your radio TVs, etc., <clears throat> and on your newspapers in regards to seizing and deceasing and supporting Israel. They want to eliminate Netanyahu. Well, these people have been brutalized ever since they came into existence. You can say, for example, that they are now paying back to what everybody has done to them by getting rid of all the people in Gaza. Because that's what's happening. And in war, listen, in war, if you're not getting food, hey, well, let me share something with you, Palestine. If you're not supporting yourselves with food and markets, etc., it's not anybody else concerned to support you. In other words, as a family, and as a wife, etc., and families, they go to work to support their livelihood, right? Well, shouldn't the Palestinians do the same thing? Shouldn't they grow their own food? Should the people in Gaza do the same? Shouldn't Israel do the same? Everybody should be doing the same. But while they had the audacity to build all those tunnels all over underground of Israel, Israel is taking advantage of all that is taking place to get rid of all this evil. There has to be a limit, yes. Yes. And these people, these Palestinians and others that are there in that country, they're crying that they don't have no food. It's not the United States' responsibility. It's not Russia's responsibility. It's their own responsibility. They're crying they ain't got no food. They're killing their people. Well, look at what they've been doing to everybody else. And everybody wants to defend sides, etc. But I got a solution for you. Have you been keeping and obeying his Torah? Have you been keeping his Ten Commandments? Be honest. Because the prophet in Zephaniah chapter 2, verse 4, it's coming. And our Savior is going to get the hook and put it underneath the jaws of Russia, Magog, and he's going to pull them into the war. You see, that incident out there is going to be so overwhelming, people. When the United States military leaves Israel and protecting them, they're all going to come in and have a party. Our Savior is going to intercede in that issue. The National Sunday Law would have already been passed in the United States. The Universal Sunday Law would have already been passed in the world. And then there were going to be a legislation taking place for a universal death decree to get rid of all the Sabbath keeping commandment keeping people. It's just not that, that it's their, no, no, no. It's not their problem. It's that they're figuring that somebody's got to take the blame like everything else. And they're going to come after you. 
So when he says, go into the mountains, Richard, and I will protect you there with the trees and the mountains and the rocks so that you can plant your food and get prepared for when I'm coming. Because the water and the food is going to be sure only in that one hour of Revelation chapter 17. In that process is Jacob's time of trouble. You know, in reality, we've been living in time of trouble for a long period of time. You got your little time of trouble? That's history. We're in a time of trouble right now. Jacob's time of trouble is coming. But it's being held back because the people are not all sealed. And the sealing is going to stop when the people are found who, who are worthy to be in the kingdom. That's one. The reason why I'm sharing this study with us this morning is because if you're going to go to Tennessee, you're going to your grave sooner than you thought. People over there hate each other. I don't, I, I, I've been there. I've worked there. I've lived there. They don't have any love for themselves. More or less love other Afro-American people. This is a, a terrible place to live. People need to get along. In these last days, don't combine yourselves and live with each other if you can't get along. Find other locations to go to. You don't have to be 30, 40, 50 people living with each other and you can't get along. And if you can't get along, you're not going to be in the kingdom. So it's better to have two or three families living together in secluded locations. And training your children how to be quiet, etc. When to go to sleep. When to turn on the fires, etc. Because I can see your fire a mile away. Your flashlight, etc. Your talking, etc. It echoes. Ladies and gentlemen, this thing is going to be so horrible that the only thing that can save us and help us is Yeshua HaMashiach and the angels. The angels are going to protect the people who are keeping His covenant, statutes, judgments, and ordinances, His Ten Commandments. Yeshua cannot protect you if you're not under His covenant and you're under, not understanding His nomos, His laws. He's given us 6,000 years to build ourselves up we got more information today than any other prophet ever had. And I got to pick up dead people every day. And I look at them, I'm looking at you. Do I have to pick you up one day and take you to the funeral home and tag you and put you in the freezer? Until you're ready to put down six feet under the ground? Or put you in the iron and smoke you for four hours until you're nothing but dust. And the only thing that's left is your hip bone, which takes longer. Ladies and gentlemen, this is not a joke. My counsel for you is to get yourself someplace out in the mountains. And don't tell anybody. Because there's a lot of snitches that are Seventh-day Adventists and Christians, etc. And there's a lot of people that are going to look, look for a way out and they're going to report you to the Catholics. It's prophecy. It's Paul and Megan, page one. It's here. The Sunday law, it's here. They are watching the strained, restless relations that exist among the nations. They observe the intensity that is taking possession of every earthly element. And they recognize that something great and decisive is about to take place. That the world is on the verge of a stupendous crisis. That's where we're at right now. Angels are now restraining the winds of strife. The four angels in Russian chapter 7. That they may not blow until the world shall be warned of its coming doom. But a storm is gathering ready to burst upon the earth. And when God shall bid his angels loose the winds, there, sh there will be such a scene of strife as no pen can picture it. And again, later that same year, take note, oh, that God's people had a sense of the impending destruction of thousands of cities now almost given to idolatry. 
Six years later, in the year 1909, she described a vision she had received at Loma Linda, California, allá in California. April 16th of that year, during a vision of the night, I stood on an immense from which I could see houses shaken like a reed in the wind. The buildings, great and small, were falling to the ground. Pleasure resorts, theaters, hotels, and the homes of the wealthy were shaken and shattered. Many lives were blotted out of the existence, and the air was filled with shrinks of the injured and the terrified. <coughs> Ellen White saw a vision in regards to destruction that was coming to Loma Linda in California. And so everybody, all the Seventh-day Adventists went and hid. And when the storm passed away, you probably remember sharing this story with you a while back, then all these Seventh-day Adventists rose up. Number one, there wasn't no pastors because they came back. They all hid. Not only them, but their wives, their children were embarrassed. You see, the first ones to go down are all these pastors of all these denominations. Because they weren't speaking the truth since they graduated. And they're still not speaking the truth. They all got up and they all prayed and chose people to be their leaders who were consecrated. Now men and women were rising and children who were intimidated, shy, and embarrassed. They were empowered by the latter rain to give the message unadulterated. This is their Seventh-day Adventist brothers and sisters. They're mine too. I care for them. But you're Pastors aren't preparing you in the churches. Instead, they want to break the Sabbath and they want to ask you for tithes and offerings. Instead of waiting until after the Sabbath hours and collecting tithes and offerings. Have you been receiving the seal of Yahweh in your foreheads? The destroying angels were at work. One touch and buildings, buildings so thoroughly constructed that men regarded them as secure against every danger quickly became heaps of rubbish. There was no assurance of the safety in any place. I did not feel in any special peril, but the awfulness of the scenes that passed before me, I cannot find words to describe. It seemed that the forbearance of God was exhausted and that the judgment day had come. This is what we're going to go through. The angel that stood by my side then instructed me that but few have any conception of the wickedness existing in our world today. That's present tense. Especially the wickedness in the large cities. He declared that the Lord has appointed a time when he will visit transgressors in wrath for persistent disregard of his law. It's all about the law right now, people. It's all about the Ten Commandments. And it's going to be about the law. So while the United States and international law and also the NATO alliances and all the regions, they're coming in and superseding and bringing out their laws of government. And if the people are not re obeying, they're going to be put to death. They've done away with the Ten Commandments is what I'm sharing. And you who have special light, much privilege has been given to you. And if you don't give the light, then you're going to go to hell. The next year she wrote, The time is near when large cities will be swept away, and all should be warned of these coming judgments. Look at what happened in Rome. Rome was hit just a few hours ago. It's flooded. Flooded. An earthquake hit New York City, 4.7, the Richter scale. Did you feel it in New Jersey? No, New Jersey felt it. Is it any coincidence our Savior is trying to tell us something? She voiced an appeal to Christians within her own church, not only to warn the wicked, 
but also to prepare their own lives that they might meet the appearance of Jesus with peace in their hearts and a smile upon their faces. In closing, soon grievous troubles will arise among the nations, trouble that will not cease until Jesus comes. <coughs> Excuse me. As never before, we need to press together, serving Him who has prepared His throne in the heavens and whose kingdom ruleth over all. God has not forsaken His people, and our strength lies in not forsaking Him. Can we hear an amen? The judgments of God are in the land. That's a fact. I want you to understand this. The wars and rumors of wars in Matthew chapter 24, verses 6 through 9, it's going to continue until the end, and it's going to get more severe than any war has ever existed. The destruction by fire and flood is increasing in leaps and bounds. Say clearly that the time of trouble, which is to increase until the end, is very near at hand, we have no time to lose. It's time to get baptized. You don't need to learn all 27 fundamental beliefs to be baptized. Are you listening to me? In reading? Finally, employing an interesting metaphor, she spoke of the special work of the heavenly angels during the sealing time. We're in the sealing time now, and the sealing time is going to close very soon. We don't know the day and the hour when it's going to close, but it's going to close very soon in order for the remaining prophecies to take process. There is an injection taking place. Concerning which most Christians were unaware, Satan is now using every device in this sealing time to keep the minds of God's people from the present truth. To cause them to waver, I saw a covering that God was drawing over his people to protect them in the time of trouble. Jacob's time of trouble is after the time of trouble. And every soul that was decided on truth and was pure in heart was to be covered with the covering of the Almighty. There's your answer. The covering. You need the present truth. You need the correct messages. So that you will be sealed. Let me read it again. In this sealing time, to keep the minds of God's people from the present truth and to cause them to waver, take note. Now, here's your answer. I saw a covering that you must have, mandatory, covering that God was drawing over his people, who keep his statutes, judgments, and orders, his commandments, over his people to protect them, them only, in the time of trouble, which is now, today in 2024, and every soul that was decided on truth and was pure in heart was to be covered with the covering of the Almighty. There is hope for you. Now you have a foundation. You received the early rain. You've been planted. And the fullness is going to be given to you at the second advent because you have the covering already. Right now, today, you've had it. Here's your answers. Satan knew this. Listen now. And he was at work in mighty power to keep the minds of as many people as he possibly could wavering and unsettled on the truth. Get the books that are correct. That's what's being discussed here. I saw that Satan was at work in these ways to distract, deceive, and draw away God's people just now in the sealing time. Because he was the one who was involved in changing the writings of Alan G. White with fallen human beings that were Seventh-day Adventists and Trinitarians. And they were Sunday keepers. Were they really consecrated? There was only eight pioneers. Not the whole stack of a bunch of apostasy were pioneers. Uriah Smith was not a pioneer. As a matter of fact, Wagner Sr. was never called into the ministry. He was an adulterer until he died and was married. So you tell me, is our Savior using that guy? Did he use that guy? I saw some who were not standing stiffly for present truth, present tense today. Listen, this is a prophecy. Their knees were trembling and their feet sliding because they were not firmly planted on the truth. 
and and the covering of Almighty God could not be drawn over them while they were thus trembling. Satan was trying his every art to hold them where they were until the ceiling was passed, until the covering was drawn over God's people and they were left without a shelter from the burning wrath of God, which are the seven last plagues, in this seven last plagues. Holy Sabbath. This is not a smooth sermon. Can you handle it? God has begun to draw his covering over his people. What does it say? Listen to me. God has begun to draw this covering over his people and it will soon be drawn over all who are to have a shelter in the day of slaughter. God will work in power for his people and Satan will be permitted to work also. So you've got two forces working at the same time. It's over. In early writings 43-44, you need to read it because it's corrupt to the core. You need to go over this. Your correct writings is found in Christian Experience and Views, page 25 to 27, which is correct. I was planning on reading it, but I don't really have the time. I believe I'm out of time. No? Okay. Let me read it then. Let me read it. I'm on page, I'm in Christian Experience and Views, I'm on page 25. 25, 26, 27. Let me read a synopsis. Satan knew this and was working, excuse me, Satan knew this, comma, and was at work in mighty power to keep the minds of as many as he possibly could unsettled and wavering on the truth. I saw that mysterious knocking in New York City and other places was the power of Satan and that such things would be more and more common. Clothed in a religious garb, to lure the deceit, the deceit, the deceived to more security, and to draw the minds of God's people, if possible, to those things, and cause them to doubt the teachings and power of the Holy Ghost. This is the quick writing, not this mess. I saw that Satan was working through agents, in a number of ways. He was at work through ministers who have rejected. Listen to me. I hate to put these guys down, but listen to me. I saw that Satan was working through agents in a number of ways. He was at work through ministers who have rejected the truth and are given over to strong delusions to believe a lie that they might be damned. While they were preaching or praying, some would fall prostrate and helpless, not by the power of the Holy Ghost, but by the power of Satan, breathed upon these agents and through them to the people. Some professed Adventists who had rejected the present truth while preaching, praying, or in conversation used mesmerism to gain adherence. And the people would rejoice in this influence for they thought it was the Holy Ghost and even some that used it were so far in the darkness and deception of the devil that they thought it was the power of God given them to exercise. They had made God altogether such an one as themselves and had valued his power as a thing of naught. Some of these agents of Satan were affecting the bodies of some of the saints, those that they could not deceive and draw away from the truth. By a satanic influence, oh, that all could get a view of it as God revealed it to me, that they might know more of the wiles of Satan and be on their guard. I saw that Satan was at work in these ways to distract, deceive, and draw away God's people just now in this ceiling time. That's present truth. Mm -hmm. I saw some who were standing still for present truth. Their knees were trembling and their feet were sliding because they were not firmly planted on the truth and the covering of Almighty God could not be drawn over them while they were thus trembling. Mm -hmm. Take note. Do your comparison. You want to be in heaven? It's your responsibility. Satan was trying his every art to hold them 
where they were until the ceiling was passed and the covering drawn over God's people. And they left out without a shelter from the burning wrath of God in the seven last plagues. God has begun to draw his covering over his people. And it will soon be drawn over all who are to have a shelter in the day of slaughter. God will work in power for his people. And Satan will be permitted to work also. Take note. You got two groups. I saw that the mysterious signs and wonders. Let me listen to Let me share this now. I saw that the mysterious signs, signs and wonders and false reformations would increase and spread. The reformations that were shown me were not reformations from error to truth. Listen to me. Let me read that again. The reformations that were shown me were not reformations from air to truth. My accompanying angel bid me look for the travel of soul for sinners. No, no. Look for the travel of soul for sinners as used to be. I looked. She says, I looked. But could not see it. For the time... For their salvation is past. Did you know that this book, A Sketch of Christian Experience and Views, was her first book, 1851, and it is a synopsis of all that she wrote in regards to what's coming? Has enough information to take you home. Would you like one? And they turned around and rewrote it along with the supplement, along with the 1858 into the early writings. So if you were following me correctly, you would have seen that it didn't read exactly because this is corrupt. That's why I've given you early writings, which is from the devil, corrupt book, she didn't write it. Pages 43 and 44, heirs to the core. You want the mark of the beast? Christian Experience and Views, which is this book, is page 25, 27, it's correct. That's a seal. For this reason, loved ones, since you are looking for these things, be careful to be found by him in peace, without spot and without blame. Verse 14. In closing, things will be so bad in the final days before Jesus returns that the primary question of even the wicked will be, the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? Revelation chapter 6, verse 17. Ellen G. White was correct. Because if she wasn't correct, I wouldn't even be talking about her. But you've got all these stupid, dumb pastors preaching to you a bunch of mierda, a bunch of trash, that you're believing them, and just because man ordained them, you think that they're ordained by Jesus Christ. They're not. When are you going to wake up and start realizing that you need to start your own home church, you need to start your church, you need to start keeping the commandments correctly, the health message and the dress code. You don't need to go to a church building where they pay funds and tithes to the devil. They pay 10% to Vatican Rome. The general conference pays 10% of the income that you give in your tithes and offerings to the churches, they give it to Rome. But you don't care, you didn't know that, did you? But everybody says, well, show me, Richard, where all this comes from. Well, what it is here is that you want to know hey, what's going on, what's going on. But are you consecrated? That's what's more important. You're responsible for what you do, even if you give them a penny. You're not supposed to be part of them. Ironically, their question is, but the echo of an ancient psalm sang antiphonally, by the Israelites as they journey three times each year to the annual national feast, Passover, Pentecost, Tabernacles. Those are the three feasts we're going to keep in the new heaven and new earth. But you didn't know that. You don't care, so I'm going to continue. As they climb the step, the steep ascent from Jericho Plain, 800 feet below sea level, to Jerusalem on Mount Zion, 2,000 feet. 2,500 feet above sea level. One group would sing to the other. 
Who shall ascend into the hill of the Yahweh, or who shall stand in his holy place? Hmm? And the answer would come from the other group. He that hath clean hands, Psalms 24, verse 2 to 5, and a pure heart, pure mind, your, your heart only pumps blood, who hath not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully he shall receive the blessing from the Yahweh and righteousness from the Elohim of his salvation. Then said Yeshua, Go and do thou likewise, Luke 10, verse 37. What I say unto you, I say unto all, watch, watch. Mark 13, 37. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. All seven churches, even Laodicea. Six churches, Philadelphia, the remnant people go through and repeat the message. She established the Philadelphia church, brotherly love, a copy. Revelation 2, 7, 11, 17, 29, 6, 13, 22, 13, 9. Turn with me to Revelation chapter 22. I'd like to close with this. <coughs> Revelation chapter 22 and verse 14 or verse 12 and behold I come quickly and my reward is with me to give every man according to his work shall be I am Alpha and Omega the beginning and the end the first and the last blessed are they that do his commandments that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city Verse 16, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. Verse 17, and the spirit and the bride say, Come, and let him that heareth say, Come, and let him that is a thirst come, and whosoever will, I am, and whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. In conclusion, in verse 15, For without our dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers and murderers and idolaters, and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. That's the ninth commandment. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Seventh-day Adventists. Books of any order came in and changed the structure. And it began in 1863. Nothing but apostasy to today. They go down deep into hell, review in hell, volume 3, page 69. They will be a part of the ecumenical movement, which is present tense, they're there now. And they will be a part in pushing a Sunday law. You may read a lot of this information in Christian service, also in Signs of the Times, page 155. They will persuade the men and the women to keep the first day of the week. Our Father who art in heaven, Forgive me of my sins, I will be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is thy kingdom, and thy power, and thy glory forever and ever. As we go our separate ways, may we continue to walk with you, and speak to thee in spirit and truth, for you seek such to worship thee. In the name of Yeshua we pray. And Yash, 